ahead and begin. All right, everyone. Just gonna watch those numbers rise for just a minute. You could be anywhere on this fine Thursday evening and you're here with us. We love that. So good to see you trickling in. In Amherst, it's been a pretty rainy day, stormy day even. Um, we're glad to have the rain because we've been in a pretty significant drought all summer. But uh, now the evening has cleared up and it's sunny and we're ready for some poetry. So uh, hello everyone, our numbers are, are looking good. So I'll go ahead and begin. I wanna um, welcome everyone to our September installment of our monthly Phosphorescence Poetry Reading Series, which is also our Thursday evening program of the Emily Dickinson Museum's 2022 Tell It Slant Poetry Festival. My name is Brooke Steinhauser. I'm program director at the museum, and I am delighted to be here with all of you for an evening of poetry and inspiration. And if you'd like, you could go ahead now and hop into the chat um, and let us know where you're coming from. We have had over 2,200 folks from over 40 countries register for our festival so far. Um, and that sense of community has just been amazing. So thank you for being a part of that. Um, let's see who's who's chiming in. We have some folks from Indiana and Georgia and hello Mary in Providence, Rhode Island. Hello France. Uh, let's see we've got Maine and Colorado and Virginia. We've got some Syracuse New Yorkers. We've got South Dakota. Wow. Um, Philadelphia, California. <laughs> it's so great to see you all. Thank you for thanks for being with us. Um, and we hope you'll keep using the chat as a place for affirmation and encouragement tonight. Tonight we're going to be hearing original work from three poets, followed by a Q&A. And we hope that you will participate by placing your questions for the poets into the Q&A box, which you can access from the bottom toolbar of your Zoom screen. The chat can be a really busy place. We hope it'll be a busy place. We wanna hear uh, your appreciation for these poets. Um, so we're gonna be looking for your questions in the Q&A box and you can, you can feel free to type them in there at any point this evening. One more note for you is just that we're using Zoom's live transcription feature, which creates captions of the best of a computer's ability. So please do forgive any errors there and feel free to toggle your subtitles on or off uh, for yourself by visiting the live transcript button in your toolbar. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our featured poets. We're gonna be hearing first from Jessica Cuello whose manuscript Liar has been selected by Dorian Locke for the 2020 Barrow Street Book Prize forthcoming in October 2021. She's also the author of Pricking, which came out in 2016, winner of the 2017 CNY Book Award, and the book Hunt, which came out in 2017, winner of the 2016 Washington Prize. In addition, Cuello has published three chapbooks, My Father's Bargain, By Fire, and Curie. Cuello was the recipient of the 2018 New Ohio Review Poetry Prize, the 2013 New Letters Poetry Prize, and a 2015 Salt and Stall Writing Fellowship. And in 2014, she was awarded the Decker Award from Hollins University for Outstanding Secondary Teaching. She teaches French in Central New York and is a poetry editor for Tahoma Literary Review. And her new book, Yours Creature, is forthcoming in May 2023 from Jack Lake Press. So thank you, Jessica. We're popping all of this and links into the chat for everybody. And tonight, Jessica is tuning in from Syracuse, New York. Next, we will be hearing from Joan Kwan Glass. Joan is the Korean American author of Night Swim in 2022 from Diode Editions and is author of three chapbooks, uh, which were published by Harbor Editions and Milk and Cake Press. And she serves as editor in chief for Harbor Review as a Brooklyn poets um, is a Brooklyn poets mentor, and is a proud Smith College graduate and has been a public school educator for twenty years. Her work has won or been finalist for several prizes, including the Subnivian Award and the Lumiere Review Poetry Award. And her poems have been nominated for the Pushcart Prize and Sundress Anthology Best of the Net. Joan's poems have been published or are forthcoming in Prairie Schooner, Rhino, Rattle. The Rupture, Dialogist, 
Hayden's Ferry Review, and elsewhere. And she lives in Connecticut with her family, which is where she is tuning in from tonight. Joan, thank you for being with us. Then lastly, we're going to hear from Eugenia Lee. Eugenia is a Korean-American poet and the author of Bianca from Four Way Books, forthcoming in 2023. We've got three new and exciting books from these authors. Um, and Blood, Sparrows, and Sparrows, which came out from Four Way Books in 2014. And her poems and essays have appeared in numerous publications, including The Nation, Pleiades, Plowshares, Poetry, Waxwing, and the 2017 Best of the Net Anthology the recipient of Poetry's 2021 Best Hoken Prize, as well as fellowships and awards from Poets and Writers Magazine, Kundaman, and elsewhere. Eugenia received her MFA from Sarah Lawrence College, and tonight she is coming to us from Long Island, New York. So poets all, thank you so much for being with us. We're looking forward to hearing your reading and to talking with you after you've all read. So we're gonna turn it right back over to you, Jessica. Thank you so much, Brooke. This is a really special reading for me um, because of Emily Dickinson and also to read with Joan and Eugenia. And I think this may be my biggest reading ever. I'm going to read poems tonight from my book, Liar, came out almost a year ago, October, 2021. And so this is, I feel like this might be my final reading. And when I was first putting this book together, I, um, I had an epigraph by Dickinson and I took it out. So this may be the only place I will ever share it, but it originally had the epigraph, it would have starved a gnat to live so small as I. Limbo. I draw an eye on my notebook, a swirl of ink, I'm not sure whose, but it sees me when my brother can't. He lives with us, but died somewhere back in childhood. He won't say how. His limbs move well enough to walk to school and back. I've seen his vacant eye, seen him in the hallway in his same sweatshirt, he won't pronounce my name. He skips the eye. He shuts his door. We once were close, walked hand in hand. Pre-language, we shared a bed. My notebook eye is more alive than he. Grain of paper, welt of ink. It sees more than a dead boy. And because he does alive things like sleep and eat, I can't mourn. I nod when the school's visiting doctor asks if I eat three meals a day. In my family, you recreate invisible and freeze like a rabbit you do not cry. God can read your mind. In my family, you lie in the snow and dream how your birth happened. The rough edge of the tabletop, the knuckles of the artist father who paints all night in a disease, then leaves and leaves. No one confesses anything. The black and blue mother scrapes herself together and into the world comes a baby with her mouth open. In my family, you tame your needs. You bite, but don't chew the winter leaves. You drink milk white snow from your mittens. At five, I burn down my grandmother's bathroom. This one is a true story. The first time I met my new family, I lit a match in the bathroom. I wanted to make a flame. It was an accident. Downstairs, the strangers ate and drank. It spread from my hand to the toilet paper, to the fringed edges of the curtain. I tried to blow it out in a panic. It flamed and grew. The shower curtain melted. Surrounded, I shook the knob. The fire grew. I called out to my new cousin. Her name was new to me. 
please open the door. Sirens came to us. I stood apart. It was Christmas. The firemen dragged hoses through the snow up the stairs. They questioned me. I lied like an orphan. We found this match, they said. I shook my head, kept my lie. My grandmother never questioned me. She told my mother to hug me. Arms touched me. I ate. I slept in a bed inside the strange house that I had burned. My new grandmother repainted the bathroom in yellow with a flower pattern. My brother sang pyromania at me for years after. Get up, gather around. We're going to burn this bathroom to the ground. I kept shame. 40 years later, the same yellow flowers were on the wall in her shower. My grandmother was 100. She forgot we weren't blood relations. She said, Jesse, you inherited my singing voice. I was hers, her last day on earth in the hospital bed. She hid behind the stove in her childhood row house. She chewed an imaginary food, tastes like cherry. She talked to people we couldn't see. We are going to the ice house. She saw people on the other side. It was her first time going to the ice house and the light was not flame, but growing. I have two more. That shirt makes you a whore because it's black. I paid for the whore shirt with my own money, bought it at the mall. It was buttoned down and satin to the touch. Who was this whore that had never kissed anyone, not even her mother, who would not menstruate until she was old enough to leave home, until she had tasted fat, the pleasure of its death? Hornus must have started at the sleepovers when we played hooker. We stripped for each other. No. Hornus started younger, at three, at two, at birth, in the womb, whoring with bald fists and floating in the whore sea. When the 11 year olds played streetwalker, I was the best. What did the best mean? It meant no smile. It was shame in girl form, which was shame's first form. It meant relinquish the body, it meant do not eat in front of others, do not pee in public bathrooms, not even school. It was the body in plain sight, but hidden, the girl's small cocked hip in the room of girls. And my last poem, it's also a true story. My babysitter, Karen B, who was sent to Willard Asylum, Willard Asylum um, was an institution that shut down in the 90s and it's in my area up here in central New York. There are only two photos of me as a child. She took them. She had no child. She had cool cigarettes and a job at the drugstore. She gave me the Crayola box with the built-in sharpener. 400 suitcases were stored in the attic of Willard Asylum for the Chronic Insane. She joined her twin brother there. She wore her black hair down. A child could admire it. She bought me an Easter basket, a stuffed rabbit whose fur rubbed off. She walked everywhere. She painted circles of blush on her cheeks. Looney, people said so. I mean, grown-ups who saw signs, who passed her on our street before she started to call and say, remember. On the phone, she said, remember, remember the date we killed her brother, forgetting he'd been committed. I took her hand and tagged along like an animal. She was perfect to a child. In 1995, when the asylum closed, an artist took photos of the 400 suitcases. The photos were put online, the contents laid out respectfully. In the open suitcases, belts, pocket knives, Lone Ranger cards, keys, ribbons, shoe polish, mirrors, pills, a fountain pen, 
bottle of glycerin, a zither, kit of needles, bread ration card, the gospel of John, a letter. Each suitcase had a name, Lena C, Lillian L, Mary T, Gloria P, Cassie M, Francis T, Marion R, Catherine S, Dimitri Z, Ruby C, Anthony C, FJL, Viola G, Alice T, Carrie L, Karen B, remember. Thank you for listening. It's really special to be here. I can't wait to hear Joan and Eugenia. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I this this reading also I smiled when Jessica said that this was an important reading for her because um, Eugenia and Jessica are two literally two of my favorite living poets in the world. Um, I just love their work and I love them as people. So it's it's very exciting to be reading with both of them. Um, and at the Emily Dickinson Museum, just amazing. It's really like a dream come true on so many levels for me. Um, I'm just remembering like being a 17 year old Smith College student and knowing the Emily Dickinson Museum was right down the road. Um, so it's really beautiful to be reading. I'm going to read a couple of poems from my um, full length poetry collection, Night Swim, which came out through Diode Editions. Um, it was only five months ago. It feels like a decade ago. It's just been so busy um, and so much has been happening. But I am going to read a couple of poems from, from this collection, one poem from my newest uh, chapbook, and then a couple of poems that are in a developing second full length collection. So I should preface the first couple of poems just by sharing content um, which is that in 2017, I lost two very close family members to suicide, my sister and her 11-year-old nephew. And so some of these poems talk about um, the grieving process and um, obviously pain and healing as well. Uh, all of my poems really um, deal with intergenerational trauma. So I just like to tell people that and let them know what's coming up front. Um, this first poem I wrote, I'm a middle school teacher, and I wrote this poem about um, the first morning of uh, after finding out that my nephew had died. It's called First Sunrise. Ten hours after he died, I stood at the copy machine with the other teachers, photocopying readings for my substitute. I hadn't told anyone yet. As I held the book down against the glass to scan it, a green laser lit up the room. My hand became an alien hand, the air some exotic, otherworldly vapor. But then the math teacher snapped at me for putting the wrong color paper in tray four. And I was still human, oxygen filling my lungs. The Spanish teachers chatted in Spanish as students jostled each other in the halls or walked with their heads down. The sun had not risen yet on that first day without him in the world, but it did. It has every day since. Um, the loss of my sister was a much more complicated emotional experience for me. Um, and this poem, this next poem that I'm going to read is actually the last poem that I wrote for the collection. Uh, and it was the one that I put off writing the longest. Um, it's called Elegy for My Sister's Journal. When the policeman handed me your journal in the evidence bag, I left it there unread claiming some small victory and refusing your final words. And when the psychic at a party claimed to have a message for me from you, I shook my head and said, no, thank you. 
A year after your death, I awoke to your fist, urgent, banging against my bedroom door. I could have opened it, could have given you the chance to unburden yourself. Maybe after I listened, you would finally have left me alone. The truth is, all of this could just be my strange way of taking a stand. My sister is gone, and no ghost can take her place. Can you see me here writing this poem, brooding in our childhood bedroom, stuffed animals smiling stupidly from the dresser? I'm staring unblinking at the scorched doors the way a child does when sulking. Keep your journal and your fist. Instead, give me the bag in which you took your last breath, the film that lifted away from your cheeks, cheeks I once compared to winter apples. Give me the last thing you laid eyes on, vase of fake flowers on the nightstand, your daughter's photo on your home screen, the window sealed shut from the inside. Um, this next poem is, it might be my favorite poem in the collection. Um, it's about a mall, uh, but it's it's also about how you can't really understand the depths that grief brings you to until you experience it yourself. So you can have empathy, but it's very difficult to truly understand it um, until it happens to you. This is called The Worst Thing. When I think of grief, I remember the time I ran into Mrs. Arabo outside Somerset Mall. Two years after her daughter, my friend Dolores died of ovarian cancer. I was carrying bags out when I saw her standing next to the revolving doors, smoking a cigarette, watching the cars turn from the parking lot onto the highway as the sun began to set. She didn't see me, and I should have kept walking. If I had understood then what I understand now about grief, I would have left her alone in peace with her view of the fading light. But since I knew nothing yet, I touched her arm, smiled gently. Hello. She blinked. Her shoulders fell forward and her face suddenly became a torn page, crumpled and aged. I'm sorry, she cried and ran back into the mall. Her cigarette dropped on the ground, gave off what heat it still held, then nothing. It's five years later. I'm with my sister at the same mall. We're here because my sister wants to bury her son's favorite candy, put it in his casket with him. Haribo raspberries, the kind that look like real raspberries and are almost too sweet. The nightmare of his death is bramble bright. We are two women walking in a shopping mall, buying candy for a dead boy. Today, the crime scene company will scrub his blood from the hardwood floors, and at his funeral tomorrow, we will tuck the candy into his hand, which feels like a hardening clay version of his hand. And I will spend six hours hugging his classmates and their parents. Most, if not all of them, will become taller, older versions of themselves while my nephew will forever be 11 with an exit wound above his left temple. My 16-year-old son says, the worst thing about loss is what you no longer hear. Sounds that have become familiar, gone. Coffee grinding in the morning, gone. 
Dogs whining at the door, gone. CBS News on TV in the morning, gone. Their laughter, gone. No, he was wrong. What I know now and what I wish I had known the day I ran into Mrs. Arabo at Somerset Mall all those years ago is that what is worse than silence, what is worse than their absence, is that the world is so very full of everyone else. I want to go back to the revolving door, wave the living through as she smokes until every last one has passed, then when it's finally dark. Tell her it's okay. Go now. The coast is clear. <clears throat> This next poem is um, going to be in my next full length collection. And it's the only pantoum that I have ever written successfully. I really struggle with form, um, but I wrote this uh, about and for my father. Um, and it's about intergenerational trauma and how things are passed down. Pantoum for my father. In his goodbye note, my father blamed his parents for his inability to love us. At his bump shop on 14 Mile Road, he lowered cars on a platform. I loved to watch their steel bodies, dented or cracked, disappear, the shaft where the platform had been. At his bump shop on 14 Mile Road, he lowered cars on a platform. Sometimes I'd stand too close to the edge and hover over the shaft where the platform had been. I imagined him pulling me back to safety. Sometimes I'd stand too close to the edge and hover over. I stood at precipices and dared gravity to take me. I imagined him pulling me back to safety. My father and I are not unalike. I stood at precipices and dared gravity to take me. I've met a version of myself who doesn't need anyone. My father and I are not unalike. In his goodbye note, my father blamed his parents for his inability to love us. Okay, I have one last poem, and it's in um, my latest uh, chapbook called If Rust Can Grow on the Moon, out with Milk and Cake Press. Um, I am in recovery. I have eight years clean and sober, and I'm very proud of that. Um, and I wrote this poem as a hymn. Um, I also grew up evangelical Christian, and so uh, I've learned a lot of hymns, but I've never heard one that was written about church basements. This is him to church basements. This world loves a grand cathedral, its righteousness and pulpit, purported sanctuary of redemption, holy spire and stilled saints, history of fire and painted glass, pews where congregants pray and worship, troubled by questions they hope someone has answers to. They wait on their knees to be forgiven. But where are the songs of praise for church basements? That lower level, that rock bottom room, sunken and reverent with flickering lights, water stained ceilings, coffee stained carpets. It's full moon of chairs that appear every night at eight o'clock because a crackhead made a commitment. We don't kneel in church basements. Instead, we squat against walls and stand arms crossed in doorways. We sit slouched and messy, look each other in the eyes and say, I am an addict and I don't want to die. And oh God, is this not a kind of miracle? I prefer my angels banged up and salty 
chubby from eating cookies instead of shooting dope. They pull splinters from their wings, hug the newcomer too tightly, shake their heads at me when I don't raise my hand to share. No matter how tough I try to look, no matter how long it takes, they say, keep coming back, kid. Tonight, the addict who overdosed last month, the one who had to be revived with Narcan, is making the coffee. Thank okay. you for listening. Hi, I'm Eugenia Lee. Thank you so much to the Emily Dickinson Museum for having us here today. Um, I am a great admirer of both Joan and Jessica, and um, I have both of their books here, uh, their recent books, and I'm so excited for all the new work coming out. Um, and I feel incredibly lucky to be here and just to have my poems be in conversation with theirs. Um, I will be reading from my new book, Bianca, which will be out in March, and it revisits childhood trauma and domestic violence, but with the added perspectives of new motherhood and mental illness diagnoses. Um, in the nine years between my first book and my second book, I became a mother, I got married, and I was also diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder and complex PTSD, um, which I write about. And... Um, and I saw this Emily Dickinson poem and it, it reminded me of PTSD and sort of the timelessness of pain and it's very short. And she wrote, pain has an element of blank. It cannot recollect when it began or if there were a day when it was not. It has no future but itself. Its infinite realms contain its past, enlightened to perceive new periods of pain. So I'll read a few poems from Bianca. Family Medical History. The heart doctor glues tubes to my torso to monitor the million warring citizens within me. The machine belted to my body says, the battle has simmered to a discussion, my heart in constant murmur, not harmful, just loud. I believe a man who chases baby with a knife makes up half my blood. I believe his demons sleep in volcanoes bobbing in my veins. The gut doctor slides a scope down my esophagus and prescribes a pill packed with moons to expose all that crawls in my unlit caves. And I am thinking of the story of the pregnant dog maimed by a crash, how her pups learned to walk with their hind legs dragged, parroting their mother's injury, how we mimic the dysfunction modeled for us. The bone doctor point to a diagram of legs to explain the ache in my knees. The brain doctor suggests I forgive myself. You are not the abuser, she says. You are the child. Um, during those nine years, I also had two miscarriages and they were both missed miscarriages, which I'm sure many of you know um, is when your body is not releasing the tissue. And um, so the only term that you might need to know in this poem is a DNC, which is um, an abortion procedure, which is also often used for mis miscarriages to help the body um, remove the tissue that you know so many pregnant people and um, people with miscarriages are being denied uh, lately. And um, it wasn't until I was pregnant with my son that I could write this poem. June 14th. My children, if I may call them that, that identical pair of beans, quick to arrive, then quick to die, quit my body a year ago today. Not quit. I opted for the DNC to say they didn't leave. 
I did nothing to make them leave. They were taken in my sleep. The animal I became conjured the animal I once was. Fiend and brute and wretch, back to the wreck my husband had never met. And that lie, hounding since the first night I woke howling next to him, startled, tentative. This life doesn't belong to you. I was warned about the nightmares, that in our first years of marriage, my hells would hunt me in my sleep. All my life, my mother locked our knife block beneath the kitchen sink. Did you know not all women hide their knives from their husbands? I married a man who owns a knife sharpener. He slices everything soundlessly, the way he learned in a class about knives. I chop our produce with an air of panic, like a child who found the murder weapon. My husband once leapt out of a closet in the dark to make me laugh. I wept. No one prepares you for the terrors of a good man. My mother still calls to ask whether our doors are locked. Maybe there is no cure for this, the way the brain bends after trauma and bends the world with it. Even now, a baby cross-legged inside me, I scan the day for traces of soot sullying this honeyed life. Who was it years ago who told me, afraid and racked with undeserving, to find a mirror and look myself in the eyes? Gold. I've become the kind of creature who, on Sundays, fills seven small boxes with a bevy of pills to stick it out another week. When will I be fixed enough to hear my kids scream without tearing my father's phantom hands off me? How do demons, decades gone now, still ravage me? Tell me. I am not the thing my child will have to survive. Tell me the mob I inherited will not touch my son. Yes, the cavalcade of all that's tried to kill me may forever raid my brain, but know this. In my mother's first language, the word for fracture, for crack, is the same as the word for gold. Every Thursday for 21 months before my son was born, a doctor trained me to put the gun down and write. I understand I am one of the lucky ones. Um, I'll end with a poem from my first book, Blood Sparrows and Sparrows. And um, it's called, the, we called it the year of birthing. And so every year since 2003, so I guess, almost 20 years now, instead of making New Year's resolutions, I give my year a word. And um, it's amazing that the, the way that the year starts to shape itself around the word and the risks that you take start to shape themselves. Um, like the year of boldness, I went skydiving and entered a PhD program that I quit the following year because it was no longer the year of boldness. Um, and this particular year, we called it the year of birthing and I was maybe in my early to mid twenties. And uh, my friend, my best friend, she wasn't married and she got pregnant and she was like, it's your word. It's your effing word. That's why I got pregnant. And I was like, no, sweetie, that's not why you got pregnant. Um, but the reason I'm ending with this poem is um, I thought this poem, because while I didn't know Joan and Jessica when I wrote it, um, now I'm going to get emotional. <laughs> I, I, I do think um, that when I think about like the friends that I talk about in this poem that I'm thinking about. Oh, it's like Joe to Jessica. Oh, I didn't expect to cry. <laughs> so thank you for having us. We called it the year of birthing. God handed me a trash bag bloated with feathers. Turn this into a bird, he said. He threw me a bowl of nails and make with this a new father. God gave some people whole birds, ready-made fathers with no loose bolts. The rest of us received crudeness, used mothers. 
I banged the nails into two planks of wood and marched around a church screaming, father, father, until friends appeared, hammering the scraps they were given to make something of themselves. When beaten hard enough, some people scamper into corners sorted with similar beaten people. Others of us, the stubborn, unbreakable humans, weld our wounds to form tools. Then we spend our days mending bent humans or wiping the humans mired by all the wrong fingerprints. The morning the first baby was born in our circle of friends, we hovered over this child who, unlike us, was born whole. You were given a good mother, we said, a good father. Each one of us prayed. We scrubbed our soiled hands before we held his swaddled body. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. I feel like I can feel the applause and the appreciation from this audience who are chiming in in the chat. Um, this was just an absolutely incredible lineup tonight. Um, you three, what a gift. Thank you so much for, for your readings. And yes, I love, I love all this love for you in the chat. Thank you, everybody. Wow, wow, wow. Woo, I'm a little, a little teary myself. Um, so we do have some questions for you already. And if any of you out there would like to put some more, feel free to pop into the chat. I'm sorry, into the Q&A and add your questions there. Um, I think I'll go ahead and, and start us off. And um, this is going to touch on questions from Samantha and, and Kate in the chat as well. Um, Jessica, Joan, Eugenia, I'm really struck by the commonalities in tonight's reading of processing very difficult complicated, traumatic emotion, um, you know, the feeling of being newly adopted, the loss of a sister, a miscarriage. Um, so, you know, Samantha is wondering what, you know, what is that process for you when you're writing about something so heavy and personal? Um, Kate wonders, how do you decide what stays private? Um, and I wonder, you know, when you're writing poems like this, do you feel that you have arrived somewhere that is new and different when you're done um, having written that poem. I can um, try to respond to that. I, I'm not sure I have answers to those questions, although the, the first one, um, you know, the way that I wrote, <laughs> so I might start crying. I'm going to try not to, um, cause I'm actually wearing makeup today, which never happens. Uh, <laughs> but the poems that I wrote in my full length collection, I didn't have the courage to write for the first couple of years after, um, after the losses that I experienced, but I, then I read Eugenia's book, <laughs> um, Blood Sparrows and Sparrows. And um, I just, after reading that book, decided that what I had to say deserved space on the page, even if no one read it, um, even if I wrote a book that was never published, which is actually what I assumed was going to happen is that I was going to write this book and no one would ever publish it because it was so difficult. Um, and that's not the case. What I've found is that by writing not for an audience, <laughs> which is what I did, I wrote for myself and, and maybe for Eugenia in a way, uh, or thinking of a lot of her work, um, is that those poems that I was most afraid to write are the ones that people reach out to me the most about. So I would say that's, I'm just going to answer, I think, that part of the question in terms of process, which is to write, you know, I mean, it sounds a little cliche to write the things that scare you, but maybe to write what you feel needs to be written, whether you think anyone else will ever want to read it. 
Yeah, I, I completely agree that I think writing and publishing are two completely different parts of the process. And when you write, you write for yourself and you write what you have to write, um, not thinking that anyone will read it. I think the minute that you bring an imaginary audience and an imaginary critic into the picture, you're not writing anymore, you're performing. And um, I, I early on, I got the advice to write as if everybody I loved was dead. And, and I, that was, you know, not hard to do in the beginning. It became harder to do once I got married and then had a new set of people. I had to imagine that I was more terrified of reading my poems. But um, I do think that um, once you're free to just write for yourself, to process whatever it is that you are experiencing or going through or needing to get on the page, um, then calling it later and curating it and deciding what makes it out into the world is a completely um, different and a more um, like cerebral process. And, and that's where sort of like the artistry comes in, right? And um, you're, it's less emotional, I think, at that point, um, hopefully. Yeah, um, I feel like in many ways, poetry, um, it I'm, I'm a little older than these two other poets. And my first two books were Persona, and even Liar, I sort of disguised as persona. I can pretend it's persona um, because I snuck in a few that aren't um, about me. Um, so I'm slower to be brave, but I feel like um, poetry has actually been the tool for me to learn to believe my own story. And I would say even to believe my own feelings, which I don't always trust. I don't always trust my own perceptions, feelings, and poetry has actually, after I write something, I actually believe myself um, in a way, something about the act, and it's not simply putting it on the page, it's, it's making something, it's creating something, crafting something, and then the thing feels legitimate. Um, and then I've, I notice, sounds a little woo woo, but I notice that after I write certain poems, other things shift around me as if I'm sort of freed from the material, like I'll write a poem about something that's been gnawing at me. And then the thing that's gnawing at me, there'll be some, an email about it evaporating or that person, I, you know, so I, I mean, it's, I do believe <laughs> somewhat kind of a, a magical property to poetry. It's a lot of labor, um, a lot of labor too, but um I do think when you write these things, things your your life changes. And I wouldn't even know Eugenia and Joan without poetry. And then being near them and hearing their work affects me a lot. Like this reading has affected me really deeply. Um, and to me, that's because I, I initially wrote and it led me to them and their works and their ideas here. That's such a great segue, Jessica, thank you, into a question I wanted to ask you all so that our audience can learn a little bit more about you. I understand that the three of you have actually never met in person. Is that right? Um, you found each other online, you found each other through your work, and um, you have formed a, a kind of poetry community with each other. And I'd love to hear more about the role of, of your poetry community and what that does for your process and your craft. I'll just say really quick that Joan and I hugged for three seconds at AWP, but I still feel like I haven't met her in person because we maybe exchanged 10 words. Um, and Eugenia, I had known her work from her first book and I'm editor at Tahoma Review and um, she submitted a poem from her forthcoming book. It's actually the title poem. And usually I, let the poems I read sit with me for four weeks. And then I go back and I reread the poems that I'm considering and I reread. And I thought about her poem all night and I woke up the next morning and I'm like, oh, I really have to accept this poem, but it's too soon and I should wait. And then I, I made my husband read it and then he started crying. And then I was like, I better grab this poem. And um, so, I feel like both Joan and Eugenia were poets that their presence, I was just always aware of their presence. 
And then when this book came out, they were both um, huge cheerleaders for me and my work, which is something that I haven't always had, which I haven't asked for. It's, I'm not, it's my own fault. Um, but they were always like sharing my work and being encouraging and I didn't know them. And um, it, it, I don't know, the, it's interesting how the online world is warm and nurturing if you, if you choose that path. So I'm gonna stop talking. Um, I, I had not, I, I agree with Jessica. Like, I think both of us are really introverted and we we met each other in a room with like, it felt like there were thousands of people in it. I don't even know. The whole thing was a blur. Like AWP is this giant writer's conference and it was, it was just a complete blur, but I really look forward to spending more time um, with Jessica and her book Liar was, was really maybe the best book that I read last year in terms of like every other poem I had dog-eared and I wanted everybody to read it and I couldn't stop talking about it. It's it's that powerful. Um, something that all, and I'll talk about Eugenia in one second, but something all three of us have in common is that we all attended women's colleges. Um, so there's that, which I feel like there's something that happens, you know, when you attend a women's college, it's a shared experience and it's very powerful. Um, but the other thing is like trauma is a very lonely experience, especially as a child. And I think all, all three of us have experienced that, but then the feeling of community and intimate friendship and true understanding with other people who've experienced that. And now as adults, we get to find each other is, it's really one of the most powerful experiences of my life and one of the most important experiences of my life. So when I share someone's poem, I'm not just trying to promote their work. It's me connecting um, on a very deep level and feeling like I can't not share it. <laughs> like if I didn't share it, it would be like I'm trying to keep it for myself or something. Um, anyway, so in, with Eugenia, I actually reached out to her after I read her book and I sent her like this long rambling emo email about how amazing it was and how I was like her stalker fan and she should adopt me or something basically. Um, and so we did, we did get to meet in person at AWP and, you know, had a meal together and I asked her to blurb um, to blurb my full length collection night swim, which she did, which is like the, the things that we get to do for each other, um, and with each other as, as writers who write about these topics can just be so beautiful. Um, so yeah. I, I do want to interject and say that Sarah Lawrence is co-ed now. <laughs> I know it, it is. It, it is like it became co-ed several decades ago, I think. Um, and I went to UCLA as my undergrad, so I really, okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, to well, burst your bubble. That's okay. My <laughs> bubble is not burst. Um, but yeah, just to add on to what Jessica and Joan said, I have found that. Um, I mean, I was very lucky to meet them because they were so supportive of my poems. But um, I'm starting to learn that when you when you get those emails or connect with people, editors or writers who resonate with your work, you have to kind of pause and say, why do you resonate with my work so much? And then you, you know, stalk them back a little bit. And then you're like, oh, I see why. It's because your work is amazing. And we have so many things that um, do, do are in conversation with each other. And I think I just felt so lucky to find um, both Jessica and Joan and to, and to be able to read their books and um, shout it out to the world uh, how amazing and incredible they are. And I feel like, you know, now that I'm getting to know them as people too, I'm just benefiting um, from that as a relatively new mom. You know, they both have teenagers and um, getting to hear their stories. And um, it's not just my poetry that grows, but it's like I get to grow as a person. And I, I think it's just fabulous. And I, I can't wait to continue our friendship and continue our, our group chats. <laughs>
Well, I know one of the things that brought you together for tonight uh, as well is um, was a shared feeling of um, how exciting it would be to read. I think you wrote this in your um, one of your proposals about reading in proximity to Dickinson's legacy. Um, so why why is that exciting to you all? I feel like I keep trying to go first, but I'm just going to go first again really quickly. Um, I mean, Emily Dickinson was like this rebel, <laughs> you know, um, she could have had a very different life than she had in a life that I think so many women at that time would have chosen or assumed uh, to choose. And she didn't. She chose something else for herself. And I, I really identify with that very much um, as someone who is in recovery, as someone who has been divorced, um, and as someone who's choosing not to remarry, you know, like purposely that um, just making different choices. I'm also the only woman on the Korean side of my family who works. Everyone is a stay-at-home mom. Um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, except that it makes me different <laughs> and it makes me sometimes feel like an outsider. And so I've appreciated that, you know, just knowing some of that stuff about um, Emily Dickinson's life and some of the choices that she made to be as reclusive as she was also, I find really fascinating. I mean, like, like Joan, she was transgressive and Joan sort of touched on that part. And I also find um, she's always been there and she's always been that poet that you return to. And I find her so comforting and I find her letters comforting and her presence and the choices she made um, as a lonely person, um, myself often. I find her um, a comfort, which is one of the reasons that I read in the first place to be very simplistic. And I feel like she's accompanied me my entire life as a poet, which started a long time ago, long before I published. And it's deepened once I started reading a lot of, um, there's so many biographies <laughs> and some are really good. Um, when I actually started to understand more about who she was, it coincided a lot with my own growth as a person. Eugenia, would you care to share anything about who Emily Dickinson is to you or how she might have impacted you in your in your life? Yes, yeah. I think I um just echo what Jessica and Joan both said. Um, I think I have a very um hesitant relationship with marriage and with um and I also have a very hesitant relationship with the church. And I think in a lot of ways, Emily Dickinson's poetry and her letters especially give us access to um to ask the big questions, right? To ask the big questions about what does it mean to be a partnered person? What does it mean to be alone? What does it mean to um, think about God and, and what God's relationship is to us if God exists? And I just feel like um, she, she, she gives us permission to ask those same questions as well. And, um, and yeah, so I think, I mean, who doesn't love Emily Dickinson, right? <laughs> Well, it's, it is always incredibly enlightening to hear from contemporary poets what it is about Dickinson that um, speaks to you now and, um, and resonates with you. So thank you for, for those observations. Thank you for sharing more about um, how you know each other, the community that you found with each other. Thank you for sharing more about your process. Um, I'm going to uh, bring us to a conclusion because we are at time, but this has just been an absolutely stunning addition 
of our Phosphorescence Poetry Reading Series brought to you by the Emily Dickinson Museum's Tell It Slant Poetry Festival. I want to thank each of these poets again for being with us tonight. So Jessica Cuello, Joan Quan Glass, Eugenia Lee, thank you so much again. Um, we hope that you will uh, head to our festival platform to find out more about these poets and learn how to purchase their books. Um, all of that information is there and we're gonna paste the link into the chat now to be able to go to the festival platform. From there, you can also learn more about our remaining festival programs running now through Sunday, including the Emily Dickinson Poetry Marathon, which continues virtually starting in about 29 minutes. Um, so if you just haven't had enough poetry tonight, you can uh, sign up and, and tune in to be a listener for the Poetry Marathon. Um, I believe we're up to part four tonight. We're doing one part a day for the seven days of the festival. Um, another upcoming highlight of the festival, Saturday night, our headliners take the stage under the tent in Emily Dickinson. Dickinson's Garden, but we will also be streaming that live to a virtual audience. So you can hear from Pulitzer Prize winning Tehimba Jess and poet Sumita Chakraborty. And there's so much more in the festival. And while the festival only lasts a few more days, please do note that our Fast for Us and Poetry Reading Series actually runs monthly, March through December. So we will be continuing to bring you some of the most exciting poets in the field. Um, and if you like to support our free and accessible programs at the Dickinson Museum, you'll have a chance to donate. Uh, at the website um, when we end this program and we can't uh, we can't do it without you so thank you for your generosity um, thank you again poets it was an absolute pleasure thank you thanks everybody for being with us tonight take care take good care of yourselves and each other thank you good night